Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Curious Marketer with Vin. I am Vin of the Curious Marketer with Vin, and today I'm joined by Ammon Johns to continue our series on the fundamentals of online marketing. Today, we're going to be tackling search engine optimization as part one of a three-part mini-series within the series on search engine optimization. Today's focus is going to be on the actual search engine. So <clears throat> the topics are going to be basically how why do search engines exist and how do they work how do they work from from a from a mechanical perspective but how they can work for you as well next week we'll talk about it from the actual users but two weeks from now we'll talk about it from the actual users perspective so with that uh Ammon, say hello hello and mm -hmm. one of the things that we want to really get to today is yeah we're going to keep it practical this is us after all but there is a difference between what the search engines are trying to do with search, what the users are trying to do with a search, and, of course, what a business wants from search. And that's why we need the three different shows to kind of look at all sides of it. Yeah, at, at, at the, the, the highest level, it's complex. That's why we're going to do this in three stages, because I think there's a lot that goes into it. So why don't we start with uh, maybe a brief history of, of search engines, if you will, just a little bit of a history there, talking about the origin and evolution of how we got to where we are today. Yeah. Well, of course, it was demand-led, and it, it wasn't long before you know people have started creating these documents all over the place. Uh, the different universities have got their papers online. There's all kinds of repositories out there. How do you find anything? You know, it, we need a search function, and so the very first engines came along. The very first engines, kind of. A bit like Windows search, you know, it, it looked for file names, it, it maybe looked for titles, they weren't very advanced. So we started to get into engines that could do what they call full text indexing. And this was, if it found a web page or any document it could read, it stripped out all the formatting and stored the text. And it had a database with all the text on the page. Some of the early ones would only actually take the first couple of hundred words. Uh, then it was full text indexing, and you know one of the, the foremost of, of that was, of course, Alta Vista, Northern Light, engines like that. And that, that still wasn't enough. You know, yeah, you, you can see what's on a page, but sometimes we don't necessarily want the most authoritative source. We want that one we saw earlier, because that's what we want to refer back to, or that one everyone's talking about. Um, if, if a new movie comes out tomorrow, that's the third uh, of the series on Sherlock Holmes. You know, they've been big hit movies with Robert Downey Jr., great movies. If that comes out tomorrow and somebody is searching for Sherlock Holmes, there's a high chance that's what they mean, not Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's versions, not a paper a professor wrote on it 15 years ago. No matter how brilliant, it's probably that film they want first. So. The needs of people aren't just in how many times the, the words are in a page or how authoritative that page is even. So search engines had to adapt. They had to adapt for the ways we think about things. And this is one of the most important aspects when trying to understand how search engines look at search, is they're always trying to understand us, how we put networks together, how we put concepts together, and how we try and find the things we're looking for. Because 10% of all searches made are what they call navigational search. It's where we already know where we want to go and we're just trying to find it. The most obvious examples, this is the stuff that used to confuse people years ago. I said, why are people putting yahoo.com into a search engine? Why don't they just put it into the title bar and, and get there? Well, sometimes it's because it was simply the start page. Sometimes uh, they didn't want to do the HTTP colon slash slash www. They couldn't, it's, it was just easier to just put yahoo.com into a search engine and get that. They, uh, they didn't care that it was one extra click. They didn't care if it was the most efficient. It worked. It was reliable. And of course, with some people, the search engine was their start page. And what it was, they meant to put it into the address bar. But when that page loads, a lot of search engines moved the focus where your mouse pointer is to the search box so that whatever you type would go into the search box instead of the address bar. So the search engine for us non SEOs, the way I've always described it is it's like a person who's asked a question 
and is required to provide the best answer. I actually wrote an article a while back on it. If you think about this very non-technically, it's just another referral. I'm at a party and instead of asking a person, I ask the search engine, hey, do you know anybody that does this? Or do you know any way I can find a solution to this problem? So from the search engine's perspective, they just like the, the human who would give that referral or give information out, they're trying to give the best information, the most relevant information that applies to that particular search. So from, from that perspective, maybe we should talk about how they go about doing that. Because I, I think it's interesting. I know the, the basics of it. I think it's interesting because it informs how you actually use it down the road. So in the next few sessions, we talk about the business side of it, uh, how users respond, how businesses can take advantage of it. But you have to understand how the search engine itself is doing what it's doing. Yeah. And one of the resources I put in the uh, event page is uh, a list of, of papers on John Kleinberg's page. Now, John Kleinberg is one of the pioneers of information retrieval. He's been teaching at Cornell for years. He's been involved with so many different projects. One that we talk about is IBM's Clever project. This was the first time they looked at what they called hubs and authorities, which uh, a hub is a site that doesn't have the answers, but it links to all the people that do. It knows all the experts. Uh, it's kind of like asking your friend who's really into cars for a mechanic. You know he's not a mechanic, but you know that he will know some of the best mechanics in the areas. Right. Okay, that's a hub. Then you've got the authority. This is the best mechanic around. This is that guy who knows everything about Chevys ever. You know, off the top of his head, he can tell you every fact. So if you've got a Chevy, he's the expert. He's the authority. Now, he may not link to anything much at all. He may not even be that popular. But the fact that the hubs that really know this kind of thing point to him tells you that this is important. Kleinberg was kind of doing that. He understands how networks go together, whether that's information networks, whether it's market networks, turning that into science, turning that into a mathematical equation so that the computer can predict it and give you a good answer it is where he spent his life. Now, there's a lot of documents there, and it talks about the different techniques, the different algorithms, the different kinds of maths they're looking at to understand all of these equations, because things aren't as simple as we think they are. You know, there, there's this tendency to say, right, the GDP of this country is this, and it's got so many people, so everyone must average this amount of money. And we know that's complete nonsense whenever we look at a country. We know that uh, Pareto came up with the principle of the 80-20 rule, which found that 80% of the resources of all of a country are in the hands of just 20% of its population. Um, we talk about this principle again and again, the power law and the Pareto principle, because it comes up again and again. In your business, 80% of your profit will probably come from just 20% of where you spend your time and your resources. Um, and 80% of what you spend your time doing is only generating 20% of, of your revenue. That is just the way power laws kind of work. And they work online. They work with very popular sites. It's sometimes very difficult to find sites outside that 20%. You know, this this of all the sites out there, only 20% get any attention. They get 80% of the attention. The other 80% get 20% of the attention. You know, it, it's people, they know it's within their little cliques, it's within just their borders, whatever. So, so is this is this what led everybody to get cracking on link building and link building strategies and and it's it, my understanding of it was that it was the way at least one of the ways that the search engine determined if a site was a hub or an authority but in some way shape or form was was what was ultimately what should be put first yeah is, is that's is, is that kind of what how we got into this position now of of the whole concept of linking yes and Google was largely responsible in that Google was the first one to so publicly talk about how it looked at links. PageRank is a link algorithm. Um, I, I should add at this point, just in case anybody hasn't seen this before, PageRank is not about ranking pages. It's lame, named after Larry Page, its inventor. If he'd been called Walter Pigeon, it would be called Pigeon Rank. You know, PageRank <laughs> does not mean this is where a page ranks or this is how we rank pages. It doesn't look at pages in that way. It looks at URLs. And this is why canonicals are an issue. When the same page can be reached three or four different ways, 
i.e. with HTTP or with HTTPS, with or without the www, technically those URLs are all valid, but they're all different. And a search engine would have a different entry for each one. So you might have so many links to the www version and less links to the non-ww version but it split them it hadn't realized they were both the same it wasn't counting all of those links as to the same resource because the urls were different so can you enlighten us then as to whether or not uh linking is dead the reason i ask this is because i've read enough just to know that i don't know anything about it at a very very deep level but it seems to make sense to me that that why would they ever kill that because it is a machine, and what other way do they have of judging the authority of a source so that they can put it forth in the actual results? But why would anybody think linking is going to go away or would go away? Yandex, uh, the Russian search engine, did remove the link effect because it was being gamed so much. Um, however, they didn't have the years involved in this that Google had. They hadn't made PageRank front and center for so long. They hadn't invested quite as much into link analysis as Google had, which, you know, this was its original USP. So, yes, Yandex managed to remove that, and a lot of people think all search engines are going to move away from links. I very much doubt it, because what makes the network is the links. The edges, when we're talking about um, networks, the edges, the way they measure this is the links are the roads, the links are the, the paths, the links are these edges. The shape is defined by the links and the number of links. So, no, links are not dead. Link building, yeah, that was always a bad idea. And the engines have developed to a point where it's almost pointless. And it kind of always was. It was never meant to work the way people did it. Page rank was always about the volume. It, if somebody, if three guys in the street said, oh, Vincent, Messina knows everything about SEO. That's that's lovely. But which is more if Danny Sullivan says, actually, no, he doesn't, which is more important? It's, it's three votes versus one vote. But Danny Sullivan is himself an expert. Lots of people have already said he knows about SEO. That's how we, we can see that. So those links that all kind of lent authority to Danny mean that his vote is more powerful and any one link no that that's that's never the point we are looking at topical authority the original page rank wasn't topical it was just the number of votes but they had up oh, I mean going back to 2005 they were looking at hilltop and other algorithms the research had been done before that this is when the patents came out um, Hilltop divided things by topic, finally. It added a topicality to page rank. But there were more advanced ways of doing this. And these days, it's almost certain that they are much, much better at understanding, right, this is an authoritative site that knows about this, and therefore, when it's linking to somebody on this thing, that link has authority. Now, this is a directory. It links to anyone who submits to it. Therefore, its links are worthless. And that is important. The more you have to work to get a link, the more it's worth. Mm. If you can get a link just by asking for it, it's worth nothing. And with some of those, it's actually worth less than nothing because this is a place that's filled with spammers. It links to all kinds of bad neighborhoods. And if you want it to be listed in that, that kind of says something about you. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, it's a, it, I'm glad I asked the question because really what we're talking about here is how does Google determine, how does Google or any search engine determine who knows what? So I'm hearing then from at least the high level that you've got on page content and then off page what people think of that content and then what search engines think of those people who are considering that content. So if you've yeah. got three people that say we love this content, but, but one but those three aren't as authoritative as the one person who says this is pure ridiculousness um, Google has a way of sort of uh, sifting through that yeah um, this the, the way to think about this is kind of think about taking a community and if you ask everyone in the community a question let's say I ask everyone in town 
who's the greatest scientist? Now, most of them are going to come up with an answer. Uh, there'll probably be a couple of people who will scratch their head and mm. there'll be lots of people who will say, oh, well, uh, Einstein, Newton, and, you know, the, the big names will kind of come up. Then there'll be people who really know their science and it may be their particular field. Um, you know, maybe the, the headmaster of the local school will come up with some child psychologist as their, their scientist because that's a personal hero, a hero. Now, when we look at this, we can take those, those collective views. Okay. But now imagine that we'd asked everyone who knows about science. Okay. Now, still get lots of science names, but you're now also getting the people that they know in town. So, you know, the chemist is there, the uh, doctor is there, the, the local school teachers for science are there. And their opinions, now they've got links to them, have those links kind of as a proxy vote. It, it's kind of a very democratic process. The, the politicians that are in the Senate are there because lots of people have voted for them. And when they vote, yeah, it's one guy, but it, it's a guy with the votes of a state behind him. But Google counts the actual number of votes for each thing and the number of votes that they've got in turn. So where, did, block where has the search engines, where have they failed in this regard and how have they evolved to get better at providing the results that are most likely related to what is being searched? The big failing is that they're dependent on models. They are modeling data. They are trying to create mathematical models to solve very complex things so uh, the problem with that I, I wrote a post recently all models are wrong that's the whole point if if you didn't want something that was simplified you wouldn't create a model you would just look at the real thing so the, the point of a model is to be a simplification and in simplifying it you obviously lose some of the detail always uh, if I make a, a model battleship, no matter how great that model is, the steel isn't actually as strong as the real steel would be. So I can't use it to measure how tough this would be. Even to scale, it doesn't always work. So models are tricky. And you have to use models to be able to do all of these things. Looking at very esoteric things, you know, what is reputation? Not in the general sense you know we kind of nod at each other and go, yeah i know what a reputation is now give me a mathematical equation for it that measures it <sighs> you know now they're having to do this they've done a very good job but these are models and there are points at which that model breaks and a lot of seos over the years have looked for those points where the model breaks because that's where they can exploit that weakness in the system to get an advantage How's that work? Well, when search engines looked at the volume of links, they would create volumes of links. They would, you know, spam blogs, comments uh, with links to their site. So it looked like all of these different sites were linking to them. So they must be important. Um, when the keywords associated with links were really important, we had people do the thing, the miserable failure Google bomb. Lots of people linked to George Bush's page with the words miserable failure so if you search for miserable failure the the word that google knew everyone had voted for that was this site um those are things that got fixed over time but those are the kind of exploits that were around and a lot of people still say well at the end of the day google's a machine i can always outsmart a machine they will always be looking for the tricks which is okay except google is not made by machines Google is made by thousands of PhD scientists. Now, as fast as you're working out how to exploit things, they're working out how to fix them, how to catch you, and how to shut you down. Now, you could have a wonderful game playing against those as this big strategy game of SEO, and there were SEOs who did that kind of thing in the past, but that's not very efficient. It's much better to try and work out what the engine wants to do, what it wants to recognize, 
create that kind of site and then all of those thousands of scientists are working on your behalf they're trying to rank your site number one mm. yeah it's, a, it's not efficient but it's also not long lasting because if it's a if it's a short-term gap and the scientists find the gap and they see what how it's being exploited they're gonna look to to, to uh, plug that hole uh, so you're better off across uh, all fronts uh, it's more efficient to work in in their their flow uh, and it's longer lasting they're gonna they're, they're not gonna seek it's not their job to try to put you out of business if you will right exactly and that's probably the biggest issue is that a lot of people with business the first time they look at search engines in a new way is when they've got a business and they want to know where they rank on it that's the first time they start thinking about how do search engines rank stuff rather than are these results any good you know and i go ahead the problem is that all commercial search is less than five percent of all search the number of transactional searches as, as google defines them remember i talked about the 10 percent navigational well 10 percent are transactional but when they say transactional this means everything where you interact so looking for a forum to discuss something looking to post your cv looking to download music files anything like that is considered a transactional search because you're going to create a transaction and that is just 10 percent of all searches so if you look at the ones that are financial transactions it's less than half of that so all commercial search is 5% of search at best. 80% of search is informational. People want answers, they want information, they want to be able to research things, look things up. Sometimes that may eventually have a commercial intent, but they're not searching right now to buy. Hmm. And Google knows this. I mean, it's just the evolution of content, it's the evolution of blogging, it's the evolution of being useful. Uh, not that search engines invented this concept, but certainly from an online perspective, um, if that's the case, Google recognized the percentages of searches. And so then I would imagine you had the evolution towards uh, things of a, uh, that are utility in nature that have some utility, like, a, like an article, you know, a how-to, if you will, or this is the kind of thing you need to know kind of thing, right? This is... This is because is this because the search engine realized that this is the largest that the large percentage of people searching are searching for knowledge based information. Uh, let me quickly refer to this one. We had this question come up a little while ago. Um, Phil Aston says, "Does the term SEO still have relevance in 2015?" Um, I think it's important to get to this question early, sure. considering we're doing three shows about SEO. Um, Many agencies are moving towards the term digital marketing as the umbrella term, uh, as it covers social media, content, etc. He was thinking about SEO Moz becoming Moz, um, but he's still got most of his clients saying, we need someone to do our SEO. And that is a great question, Phil. SEO Moz didn't move away from the term SEO because SEO is a bad term. It's because, as you say, the picture is broader. Look at Look at this series. We're at episode seven before we've even talked about SEO. And we've still got shows to come after these SEO ones that are not about SEO. Marketing is big and online marketing is big and SEO is one piece. And to understand this piece, you have to know the broader aspects of marketing. You have to have content for people to be delivered to because what's the, what are you going to rank if you don't have content? What are people going to land on from that search if you don't have content? And if that content doesn't do the job, it doesn't matter how many people land on it because nothing happens. So it's because SEO is a piece of the puzzle and that bigger puzzle is digital marketing. And Moz wanted to serve more than just SEOs. There are people who called themselves SEOs who literally believed that their job was to get something ranked in the top 10 and that was it. Didn't matter if it converted. Didn't matter if it was getting actual traffic. Their job was, where does it rank in search? I've never been that kind. I've always said I am an SEO, but it's never been my job title. I'm, I'm an internet marketing consultant. I work with much broader aspects. I started off just what I call web marketing because I didn't include email. And these days I'm internet marketing because I do include email. And 
that's kind of where Moz was going. I think it's simply that as we're evolving, as SEO is getting more complex, we're realizing that just where you are in the search doesn't matter if you don't understand what we're going to be talking about next week, how people are getting to that search, what's on their mind, what's going to work, what's going to convert, which is where we'll go in the third of these sessions. So right. hopefully that that answers the question. Yes, clients still want to know how they can rank in search, but SEO itself is only one piece of that bigger puzzle. Well, you take it you take it from an offline perspective. You know, a good a good sales cycle starts with access to the buyer. Um, but if you put a salesperson in front of the buyer, they have access, but they say the wrong things. That sales cycle is quickly destroyed. Um, so it, it's a, it's an essential part. I always I always used to say in terms of sales, access is key. You can't sell if you don't have it. So rank can be compared to access and how you how you rank is an important uh, part of this entire discussion. And that relates back to what what do search engines put on page one? And I think it's complicated. It's complicated by a lot of things. We talked briefly in, in the pre-show about semantics. Um, I've read a couple, couple of the books. I've, I read the blog articles. I follow some of the discussion. Uh, we, we hear things about intent based search. We hear things about semantic ecosystems on and so forth the search engines particularly google are trying to accommodate the complexity that is user intent um, by by tracking data tracking uh, relationships between words and and things and entities and on and so forth but the goal i think of the search engine is to get closer and closer to providing search results that are a reflection of search intent correct Yes. And more and more, Google's not the only search engine. And, you know, it never has been. Google was quite a latecomer, although people may not believe it. Um, at the moment, Apple is perhaps looking at search. There's some patents that indicate they may be working on a search engine of their own. Now, they have to have search anyway, because, you know, you need to be able to find things in the, in the store. Um, Siri has to find the right answer when She's asked a question. So there's certainly search algorithms already <coughs> at play. Whether they will have a public search engine, well, that, that's an interesting uh, interesting question. But it looks like there's certainly some research in that area. Google was late to the party. Most of the early employees from Google actually came from AltaVista. Hmm. Um, because search is, it, it's a bigger field now. But back in the 90s, you know, how many people would have really thought of a career in information retrieval? That, that sounds like a glorified librarian, doesn't it? What, what are you going to be pulling little cards out of drawers? <laughs> information retrieval, eh? What, you mean I'm a messenger? I run and get information for you. Information retrieval was not the sexiest of sciences. So it didn't have masses of people, and the people who were at the cutting edge of that really were in high demand they still are today there is a big battle between being apple google for top tech people uh, people who really understand the computer sciences the networking science amazon can go into that battle as well and so can a, a hundred companies you haven't heard of yet they're all fighting for the same same people and altavista had a lot of the people that google used early on because it was exciting, they were looking in a new direction. A lot of people talk about Google, oh, they're, they're all about the money. Well, actually, no. Google is all about the science. The, the money aspect was a bolt on years later. For years, Google didn't have a business model. And when they got one, they borrowed it. The pay-per-click ads were directly ripped off of three other people who'd been doing pay-per-click ads as a bolt-on service. Uh, Overture were the most famous but there were plenty of rivals for them and overture just provided a feed that went into a search engine quite quickly it wasn't quick enough for google uh, so they decided to build their own and adwords quickly dominated that was, I was literally just going to say as you were talking about that is now a good time to talk about how search engines make money um, because i know we are going to talk a little bit about online advertising three or four sessions from here um, but you touched on it. I don't necessarily need to ask the question because that is how they make money, at yeah. least in part, right? I mean, advertising revenue. Um, how does that we, get in the way? How does that get in the way of how they approach organic search? 
it affects people's attitudes a lot and of course it it can be tricky you know you want to give good placement to advertising without taking away from the product which is what people go there for they don't come there for the advertising there are times when the ads the paid ads are some of the best results especially if you're looking for something quite commercial when you're looking for a provider or something well look that guy who's bidding the most to be number one has to be able to make more money doing that than the guy who's at number two and at number three and at number four i.e he has to have a better service overall he has to be making more money to be able to afford those ads or we won't be there very long um, and in the early days of, of pay-per-click advertising the number of companies who almost sent themselves broke bidding more than they could make back was, was quite high um, you used to have these wars where you know you carefully raise your bids for part of the day it's wait for the competitors to up their bids and then drop yours down and wait for them to run out of money for the month and you know that could happen in a day and then you've got 28 days left of, of that month to uh, be number one because they've run out of budget they're out of the results Google Actually, had a, a lot of problems with how they label advertising as you know we've got a lot more resistant to ads that are disguised as something else you know if it looks like an organic result if it looks like a search result that's kind of wrong so we want ads that are clearly mentioned to be ads i'm not sure that approach is entirely right i mean it still goes through an algorithm it's still a search result but it's not subject to the same criteria so yeah, they want these labeled so you should want them labeled because there's a it is a conflict of interest if you will you've got in one sense google putting forth the best information based on the search but in another sense it's they're putting forth those who pay the most money not necessarily the best result so it creates it creates a little bit of a conflict in that we'll, we'll come to that but that's the wrinkle that the adwords added is that they actually use a combined metric. It's the one that generates them the most absolute money, which includes click through. So if your ad has the highest bid, but people don't click on it, it actually won't be the number one ranked. No matter how much you bid, if it's not getting the clicks, that's not the point. The early ones, Overture, it was all about the ad, the bid price. Mm. But Google actually featured in the click through, which <laughs> made more money for them because it means that even if this isn't bidding the most, if it's getting the most clicks, that's the one you want people to be going to. Um, so it, it reminds me of something I wanted to ask. Uh, maybe this is a good time, but I read articles here and there on signals. Um, and I know a lot of how the algor algorithm works is speculation, but also some of it based on testing. I know guys like you and Bill uh, do testing as well as you read a lot of these white papers and pad papers and whatnot. But let's talk a little bit about the signal the signals that feed the algorithm because I think it's an important component to help people prioritize an approach to search engine optimization so I know we don't we don't have to go through the two to three hundred different signals but it would be interesting for me to discuss at least the top one or two what's what 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 is the most what influences the search engine the most oh wow that is so tricky because there are hundreds of, of different signals. The exact number is no longer known. Years ago, it was said we have 200 ranking signals. That's the oldest number we have. And that's from the mid noughties. Only a couple of years later, it was we've got 300 plus. Hmm. So anytime you see somebody say, oh, 200 ranking factors, they are a decade out of date almost. Um, that's how old that was. So if you've seen an article in the last couple of years about the 200 ranking factors, this is somebody who isn't keeping up. Google announced 300 only a couple of years later. By 2007, the 200 ranking factors was out of date. Now, it's probably very close to the 1,000. It might be over it. But what, what indicates a ranking factor is it, it's very tricky. And... As you say signals are different still there's a thing called bayesian filtering and bayesian is a kind of probability model 
and it looked at there was a great use of it for determining spam emails and it's funny what can denote spam yeah if people are misspelling Viagra and Cialis and stuff like that especially using leet speak they were trying to get past the filters that looked for the correct spelling because that was the first kind of filter if it mentions this I don't have it right so let's create leet speak and get around that filter but, well that's an even stronger sign that it's spam because now you're aware that it could be filtered out because you haven't got an opt-in list so you've created a stronger signal that this is spam but mm -hmm. it, it turned out one of the biggest things one of the simplest things for getting rid of 95 percent of raw spam is if somebody uses more than one exclamation mark and it's bold and it's red you can wipe out about 95 percent of spam that simply because the number of people that will use bold text they'll use red because it stands out and they'll put more than one exclamation mark and it's there, almost never legit there goes my entire online marketing strategy <laughs> you just you threw it all down no wonder why i'm not getting much happening on <laughs> so it, it's it's one of those things where um sometimes the the signals are a lot smaller than you would think and sometimes it is like this site has listed you that's a bad thing because it's it's a scam report site um this site has listed you that's brilliant because this is an award site and it's awards given by top judges so they've really looked into this this directory looks at you now this one is important because it uses human editors it doesn't list everyone and you have to pay to get in so you know it's a serious directory um there's different levels of signals and there are thousands of them so it sounds to me like then the search engine has the ability to contextualize the situation in such that there isn't one answer that applies to all you have to get in and sort of see what's going on in the landscape of whatever industry you're in or whatever environment you're in maybe it's not even an industry but just an environment and then look to see what's going on because the search engine is responding a certain way yes and there are things that would you know really stand out as bad in in certain places look there's certain levels of spam that would get you kicked out of if you were doing uh, your money or your life searches so if, if you've got a health site there are certain kinds of links you will not get away with there are certain practices that you won't get away with because google is trying to look more carefully at that information they want an extra level of scrutiny when this is advice that can affect your health or your finance um but you know if you look in certain other industries and yeah okay you know adult industry people do still look for this stuff google still is expected to find an answer and you know those are still customers so google needs to be able to rank things there now those sites have links and backlink profiles and, and links from porn sites well of course they do they are a porn site so for them it's going to be a completely different kind of signal it's fine for them it's not okay for somebody else yeah but what if you are a lawyer for the porn industry well these things have sliding scales and Google is aware of this those models are not necessarily perfect we talked about models already but they're pretty good and they are pretty advanced because Google's got thousands of scientists working on this I think that's a I'm almost glad I asked the question or made the statement whichever way it was formed uh, I think it's important to understand I think what you said is really really important as an insight because it speaks to what we're always talking about from this series as well as any conversations we have otherwise about the importance of viewing the world from your lens yeah. and so what you're saying now is and i think this is one of those let's put a stamp on this is that google has the ability to do some of that as well and so it behooves you to do it if if the search engine is doing that and and certainly not just take generic advice um seo advice or search engine mechanics for uh, a pediatrician is going to be different than a porn star just because of the nature of their industry yeah absolutely and uh, we talked before but you know a proctologist probably isn't going to get a huge amount of backlinks he's only going to probably have directories and a few professional bodies he's not going to have you know huge numbers of reviews and if he did that would probably stand out as a bad thing because they're probably fake because it isn't natural for so many people to have 
uh, you know, lots of reviews written about their proctologist. Um, so these things, yeah, there are sliding scales. There are places where there are natural patterns and to be different from that natural pattern may actually be a negative signal rather than a positive one. So we Let me, um, just so quickly grab this question. Please. Yeah. Uh, so Roger Mudd says, although 200 ranking patterns are out of date, doesn't it still offer a good foundation on which to begin? No. <laughs> Let me let me clarify that. It would, if Google had published what 200 factors were, we could say, oh yeah, this is where they were. But they never did. And we've still got people speculating today on what those 200 factors may be today when they haven't been 200 factors for over seven years. So if they're seven years behind speculating on where they were, they're probably not going to be very accurate at speculating where they are today. Hmm. Oh, so the idea behind that then is uh, uh, in, in your favor, and that is hire someone who knows how to test these things, right? And so we, we, in marketing speak, you, you, you think of A-B testing. Uh, I'm, I'm learning slowly but surely, step by step, some of the technical side of, of SEO, but, but also how to test these things, how to change a page and see the results, see what happens as a result of that change, document or otherwise, if it's a more complex situation, Naturally, you want to keep a, a documented trail of, of your changes and, and, and then see how does the search respond? See if it's long lasting, right? These are the kinds of things I, I don't, we'll get into it. You know, <clears throat> I'm, I'm a sales guy by, by nature, a businessman by nature, not an SEO. I, I view everything from, from the point of view of a conversion, a sale, some sort of a sign up, whatever it is, the, the, the audience takes action. So ranking to me is, is just one piece of the puzzle um you, you can rank for just about anything uh the question is does the rank get you what you want from a business perspective but what's interesting about that is that the search engine is kind of watching and they haven't told you what they're looking for so you've you've got to set yourself up to to test these things i think this is an important piece of the discussion though because it it speaks to how search engines work it speaks to what the experts know about how search engines work. And in truth, they don't until they know. They don't know now. They won't know until they know. So, so the reality is, is you've got to find somebody that knows how to figure that thing, how to, how to solve that puzzle, because it's a puzzle. I suppose yeah. there's probably some general principles that apply. I think we can all agree good content is probably a good thing. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to rank in a particular environment. So you've got to find other ways, you know. I, it, it, there are there are three ways that we get this data. Now, one is the backwards looking way, which is the test sites we've got, you know, what's going up, what's going down. Okay, so what we've done on that site is good, and what we've done on that site is bad. Okay, that's how a lot of SEOs kind of, of do this thing, is they find out which sites have gone up, which sites have gone down. That's okay. It's backwards looking though, because that site has already had to be there to, to do that kind of thing. And a brand new site isn't the same thing. Even if you copy that technique, what if that change was partly based on the age of the domain or the age of the links or its backlink profile? And you yeah, can't duplicate everything. So there's, there's other changes. The second thing is we look at the patents, the papers, the research that they do. One of the reasons that Bill and I talk about specific search engineers, people like Kleinberg or Broda or... Um, Kaushik, one of the, the reasons that we do these kind of things is because their work shows you where they're focusing, what they're experts in. Why did the engines hire these people? What did these guys know that the engine wanted to be able to use or wanted to push even further? Yeah. Mm. So looking at these papers, looking at the research is a very good indicator of what the search engines were in the, interested in. Now, of course, patents come along years later and patents, it shows you what they believed was important enough to protect the ownership of the idea. Doesn't necessarily mean they're using it. There are several reasons that you might patent something that you didn't intend to use. One would be to stop somebody else. Two would be as a kind of smoke and mirrors trick. Make the other <laughs> engines think that that's where you're going <laughs> when actually you found a better way. Um, so we can't take that as, as 
perfect stuff, but we do know that they put the time and resources into researching and putting this idea down in the first place. So we do know they were thinking of it. Again, it's, like a, it's a poker game. It's, it's, this, you're, it's, this could be years in the past. And the, the third thing is we look at that trajectory. And this is why old SEOs have a big advantage. We've watched the engines change over time. So we've seen that plot move over time so we can see where it's going. Yeah, yeah, it's on an upward trend, but is it starting to cap over? Is this a bell curve? It doesn't mean it's going to go up forever. It may be starting to come down. These kind of things are things you can only do with experience by looking at stuff over time. Now, yeah, you can start looking at papers today. You can look at 20 years of search engine history by simply going through lots and lots of papers and, and give yourself an edge. But that still takes time. And that kind of thing is where the real experts lie. It's no good knowing what worked last month. What we want to know is in six months time, what are Google hoping to do? In two years time, what are Google hoping to do? I don't care what the ranking factors are today. What I care about is what those ranking factors will be in a year, in two years, and in three years, because I need a strategy that puts my clients there now, ready for that, so that they get two, three years out of it, instead of working hard to do something that's going to stop working in six months. And I have seen too many SEOs chasing the algorithm, and yeah, they do great work that three months later was completely wasted. So then, is this a good point to, we only have 10 minutes or so, but talk about semantic search. And the reason I bring it up at this point is because it seems to be that when people start talking about semantic search, they also had a parallel conversation on how search is dead. Uh, keywords are dead. Of course, I never understood the whole concept of keywords being dead because you use words to search. So I. I guess I understand it from a tactic perspective, but generally speaking, you're always going to be looking at words because that's what people use to find things online. But where do you think, where does, where does search engine, where do search engines want to go with this thing called semantic search? Everything now is about context. And we're talking personalization. Uh, the, the whole point of semantic search is to have a better understanding of people that, two different people may use the same words in different ways and that the context can change those things. I, I mentioned the Sherlock Holmes thing earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I've got a history of classic literature and I'm searching for Sherlock Holmes, I probably do want to know about the originals. If I'm a movie buff and there's been a new movie recently, I want to know about that. One of the examples we, we pointed out that Google does today is if you search for football teams while the season's on, it will often give you either their most recent game results or what coming games they have. But off season, it's probably their homepage and stuff about their their past great matches and particular players. So what you are returned changes over time and it changes throughout the year. There are seasonal searches. But it's still it's you know, it's still searches. There's still I think so now what they're saying is then that when you're when you're looking at the phrasing or the language that you're using you better be damn sure you appreciate and understand the context of or the the varieties of context that the people you're trying to attract um are using this language and because that's what the search engine is doing as well is this correct Yes, and when we're talking about semantics, we're not really just talking about semantics. We're also talking about <laughs> these other things, semiotics, proxemics. Um, semantics is kind of the meaning of the word, and this is certainly one of the major focuses. Instead of just the word we use, what's the meaning of it? What are the synonyms? Uh, what are the antonyms? What, what else might be a great result for this? Um, if I say search engine tweaking because i've just heard about this this search engine optimization thing uh, right what, what do i know about search engine tweaking well search engine tweaking isn't the major term should i turn out sites that have used the word tweaking or should i look for synonyms 
should I look at the phrase and say, right, they probably mean search engine optimization. Let's put more of those results in there because yeah. there's, there's better data there. So that's one of the reasons why semantics is there. We're also looking at personalization. This gets mixed into it as well. Years ago, I predicted that personalized search was, was going to be there. I didn't realize how far it was going to have got by now, seriously. Um, because I thought people were going to be a little bit more reticent, a little bit more worried about how creepy it is that all these sites know what you've been doing for the past six months and a year. I thought more people would probably be a bit more protective of their data. But we've had that evolve into a subculture. So, you know, people using the Tor browser are different. People using private search and things like that are slightly different. The majority of us, and we're quite happy with our data going out. So we don't mind that Google knows where we live and you know where we've been recently and that we've just come back from holiday and what our last 85 searches were and which results we preferred out of those. We're kind of okay with that. And I think the, the future generation will be even more trusting. Well, it's like going into a bar and they give you the drink that you've ordered for the last three months. It's like, I, well, I, I like this bar because they know what I want to drink. They might even give me the cheeseburger with bacon and cheddar that I've ordered for the last three months because they know that's what I want. They don't know that I'm on a diet. They yep. don't want the cheeseburger. They're going to serve the it up. The difference is, of course, that you are aware you're in a bar and you've interacted with that yeah. barman, so you expect him to kind of recognize you. Yeah. Whereas people, I don't think, were quite as knowing that Google was going to be taking notes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it just delivers uh, the delivers the more appropriate search results for what you're looking for. Um, yeah. So, but that's you know this this is the, the things we need people to take away from this session more than anything else are understanding. You know, Google doesn't make these up. These aren't arbitrary things that Google is saying. Right, well, jump through this hoop, jump through that. Um, one of the things that I see most often from web developers is. Google should only return, you know, properly formatted sites, well-made sites. Um, you know, if it doesn't render, that's not going to be good for search, is it? Well, actually, Google doesn't care that much. Mm. Look, a lot of things, the best result is a PDF document because that's where the information is. A lot of scientists, a lot of experts are not web designers. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? The value is in what they say, not how well formatted it is. And, you know, what? You're going to downgrade Shakespeare because he, he spells funny. That guy couldn't use a dictionary to save his life. Definitely, he shouldn't be ranked up there anymore. <laughs> you don't do that. You, you look at the quality of the information that what people want. And sometimes that isn't on the best of sites out there. Let's face it, hundreds of people want to find their own site in search results. Now, that may be on HubSpot, it may be on WordPress, and it may have terrible images and not very good accessibility and that kind of... But there's thousands of those searches being done a day. There's a lot more of those people than there are of design snobs who are going to worry about whether the code is perfect. What should be done is the code should be lean, it should work across different devices, hopefully, that's going to be good. That's something Google's going to care about, that people can use it. They don't want a search result that isn't going to work for you. That makes them look broken. But whether it's the best result, whether it's, you know, cutting edge design, or whether it just works on any old browser and it looks awful, that's not so much the issue. The issue is giving them the right answer. Well, that's it. Google is then the ultimate marketer because from the very beginning of this series and from the beginning of my indoctrination into the world of marketing, the idea is you provide what the audience is requiring or requesting or what they need or want, not what you think is, is going to make you look good. Uh, I have no problems with design. I have no problems with images on and so forth. At the end of the day, uh, what's even more funny about this is when you think of a search engine optimization consultant or an SEO that just wants to get you ranked, um, if, the, if the rank isn't for searches done by the audience you want to attract, it doesn't do any good. So you can play around with the search engine. Search engine is going to deliver what what they think is is valid for a particular search, but that search might not be valid for you. Yeah. So rank is just 
rank is really just not relevant from from that point of view. We just had this exact question come up from uh, Peter Lunn in the audience. So he says, with the advent of semantic search and personalization, how relevant is it to ask the question, where does my site rank for such and such a term? With the search results for a search term being potentially different for everyone, how relevant is search engine ranking? Absolutely. You know, we get this thing of the room SEOs who, oh, well, you've got to see where it ranks logged out because otherwise you're getting personalized results. Guess what? Your customers aren't logging out specifically to see where you rank. They don't care. What matters to them is how their preferences interfere with their searches. So, <laughs> Being connected to your audience is more important than it's ever been before because they will be getting personalized results and it will be personalized for them. And you can't know what they're doing unless you've known how you influence people in the position that your customers are in before they're your customers. How you influence people there, how you predict where they're going to be, that's part of marketing. That's where we've been talking about this whole series. Understand your customers so you understand what's likely to be in their preferences and their, their personal tastes. You should have thought of that so that you are their preferences and their personal tastes so that personalized search is working for you. You are the right result, and what personalized search should be doing is filtering out the people who wouldn't be great customers for you anyway. That's exactly the point. That's and that's you know, when you look at how the search engine is doing what they do, it's just everything reeks of good marketing. You know, they're trying to find the, the results for those people. You got to make sure those people are the people you want to talk to. Um, and that's why bad SEO is uh, let's talk about ranking and nothing else. You know, and it's unfortunate because then if you try to bring it up from the perspective that we're discussing it now, you get shut down because all oh, SEO is everybody trying to peddle, you know, snake oil. No, that, that's the bad stuff. Yeah. The good stuff. Google, is Google that, are in a tricky position because the people who pay for their product, the people who pay for advertising, aren't the customers. In, in a large respect, you know, the customers are the people who search, not the people who pay to have their search ads up. Because if you don't have them, you don't have the audience that the advertisers want to reach. So you right. have to look after the audience first. And then you have to serve the advertisers. But if you serve the advertisers at the expense of that audience, that's going to kill your business. Kills the value of the ad. Exactly. Exactly that. You know, so, you are you are killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. We got two minutes left. Now is probably a good time, I think, for you to just give a summary. And again, next week, the conversation is going to continue around search engine optimization. There'll be some overlap, I'm sure. But in the end, um, what do you want people to take away? The, yeah, search engines do not just make this stuff up. There is a logic, there is a progression that these are models of complex things in mathematical terms that the engines are trying to use. And they're trying to predict as much as they can about us. This will get even smarter and it will get smarter faster. As machine learning is more and more playing a part, these algorithms can develop faster and faster. Um, there was a, an amusing thing years ago and it was the first time Larry Page was told he could no longer edit the algorithms. Um, because once upon a time, he would go in there and, and tweak little things. But at about the point where Google got, you know, a few hundred scientists, he couldn't know everything that was being done. He couldn't be on top of all of the projects, and he could be tweaking something that somebody else is already working on. So uh, that was the point at which, no, you can't just play with you. I know it's your engine. <laughs> <laughs> I know that Page Rank is named after you, Larry Page, but... You can't go tweaking stuff anymore because we've got people doing this. You need to work with those teams. When Matt Cutts is asked a question about something time and again, you'll find he has to go and ask different departments because he needs to find the people who are working on that specific thing at that specific time to get the latest answer on it. Search engines are incredibly complicated. So most of the time when you've got a simple complaint, your complaint is going to be a misunderstanding of a much more complex issue. But we'll kind of tie that up next week when we get into 
the user side of search, which is where things really start to get interesting because this is where we can play with the marketing. Absolutely. Okay, with that then, thanks uh, for the folks that uh, came aboard here today. Great questions from the audience. We always appreciate that. Um, in two weeks, we'll continue this discussion on SEO around the user experience and uh, more importantly, uh, how to make search engine optimization work for your business. So with that, uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Thanks.